The so-called copycat murders were DCAK's own homage to himself. And this was the moment when we were all meant to know it, with the television cameras rolling overhead. The whole world was supposed to be watching as the bastard put one over on us again. Is he alive? I shouted to the nearest EMT. I hadn't seen any movement from the victim since we'd come up on the roof. BP's non-palpable. Pulse 120, he called to us. Meanwhile, his partner was radioing down for a gurney. Get that mask off him, Bree said. Easier said than done. Apparently, the latex had melted onto the hot roof at the back of his head. Finally, the EMTs had to cut the mask up the front. Then, as the latex pulled away, a familiar face emerged. Bree gasped, and I took her arm, partly for the support that I needed myself. It was Kitts. The FBI man who'd given us so much computer intel was ghostly pale and covered with swollen beads of sweat. His eyes were closed. I dropped to my knees next to Brian Kitzmiller. The pads at his neck couldn't keep up with the bleeding. It was a sad, horrendous mess. Kitz? I took his hand and applied slight pressure. It's Alex. Help is on the way. His fingers fluttered in mine, barely a squeeze, but he was still with us. His eyes finally opened, and he seemed confused at first. When he saw it was me, though, he tried to say something. His puffy and blistered lips moved, but if he made a sound, I couldn't hear it. Hang in there, I told him. We've got you now. You're going to be okay. Hold on, kids. He tried to talk again, but nothing that I could understand came out of his mouth. With what looked to be great effort, he blinked twice. Then his eyes rolled back in his head. The EMTs kept at it, but by the time the gurney got there, it was all over. Kitts was gone. And he had died on camera, just the way DCAK planned it. I turned to Bree. My mind was working overtime. Kitts blinked twice. Two killers? Chapter 87 Before the police and TV news choppers got there, DCAK had worked his way across two sections of roof. Then he scuttled down a wobbly painting scaffold to a community parking area in the back, where he would be safe. He was traveling heavy today, with a laptop and camera in a black satchel slung over his shoulder. But it was nothing he couldn't handle. He was jacked up, and he was definitely into this new role. And the story. He slipped off the latex gloves, then plucked a silver lighter out of his pocket. Seconds later, the gloves were a lump of melted rubber on the cement. Let the cops try to print that, and trace the puddle back to him. Everything else about him stayed as it was. Long blonde hair in a ponytail, light growth of beard to match the bleached eyebrows, brown contacts, steel rim glasses, and a white socks cap turned backwards on his head. The name for today was Neil Stevens, he had decided. He was supposed to be an AP photographer based out of Chicago. The camera was a brand new Leica. He'd blend right in here. No problems about that. Plus, he'd get to watch the whole thing come to a climax, see all the players close up, check out their reactions under pressure. No one could have done this better, not even Kyle Craig on his best day. When he came around from the A Street side of the development, the block on 19th looked like a Barnum and Bailey circus, in a good way. He stood on the bumper of a parked car and took several wide-angle shots, Police cruisers up and down the block, ambulances, a SWAT truck in the armory parking lot, a dozen or more TV and radio stations on the scene. Hundreds of locals, it looked like. They were loitering up and down the street trying to figure out what the hell was going down. Did anybody know yet? Had they figured it out? DCAK was about to put their mopey little neighborhood on the map. Soon they would all start thanking God it hadn't happened to them. Yes, little minds would be blown sky high tonight. 
He was one of the best ever now, wasn't he? Right up there with Kyle Craig. By the time the helicopters arrived, the police on the ground had gotten their act together enough to wrangle the masses out of harm's way. Alex Cross was on the scene, and Bree Stone, too. Actually, she was getting a little too big for her britches, he was thinking. Maybe it was time to do something about that. That could be his next story. Chapter 88 Neil Stevens' AP jostled shoulder to shoulder with the other press, all of them competing for money shots across the street from the yellow house where the FBI man's body had been found. Of course, he already had his million-dollar shot. A nice close-up on Brian Kitzmiller's face. Eyes wide open, neck bleeding out like a stuck pig's. Some crazy scene, huh? Another lensman turned to speak to him, a brown-skinned fireplug of a guy. Whole story's unbelievable, right? You been covering it from the beginning? You could say that, DCAK thought to himself. Just got to town, he said making sure to flatten his vowels for a kind of nasal Chicago accent. Just got to town. He loved details like that. That's where the grace was. And the devil, too. Doing a piece on the detectives and CSI. That's my angle here. Folks love their CSI. This little turn of events is just a, uh... Lucky coincidence? The killer returned the guy's cynical smile. That's right, I guess. Lucky me. Here they come, someone shouted, and Neil Stevens of the AP raised his camera along with everybody else. The door across the street opened. Detectives Cross and Stone came out first, ahead of the body. They both looked like they'd been eating the same shit sandwich, and it looked good in telephoto. Click. Nice little two-shot of the opposition, beaten to a pulp, but not quite defeated. Still standing, anyway. Cross looked especially pissed off. His hands and shirt were covered in Kitzmiller's blood. Click. Another classic shot. The two of them joined the other cop, John Sampson, Cross's friend, who was waiting on the sidewalk. Stone said something in the big lug's ear. Click. And Sampson shook his head. He apparently couldn't believe what he was hearing. Probably the news that it was Brian Kitzmiller up on the roof. Click. 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 This shit was golden. The little guy next to him kept talking while he worked, a real live chatterbox. They say Cross over there is one of our best. Seems like he's getting his ass kicked a little on this one. Looks that way, huh? Neil Stevens said, and kept snapping away, getting each of the three detectives' faces close up, as tight as he could go. Nothing too arty, but good stuff, keeping it real. Then he pulled back some and got all three of them in one master shot. Click, click, click. Then he stopped shooting and just watched their faces through the viewfinder for several heartbeats. Is that how he'd take them out in the end? All three in one shot heard round the world? Or maybe do it nice and slow, one at a time. Stone, Samson, Cross. He hadn't decided yet. There was no rush. Better to enjoy the journey and get there when he got there. However it went down, the ending would be the same. Dead, dead, and dead. And he would be a legend, right up there with the best. So you say you just got the town? The little guy was still blabbing his ass off. Guess that means you haven't talked to any of them yet, huh? Not yet, Neil Stevens said. Not yet. But I'm definitely looking forward to it. Chapter 89 There is a sad little death of hope and optimism that happens every time something tragic and unforeseen like this goes down. It was as if Kitz's murder opened up a little more room for hatred in my heart. Was that true? All I could hope for now was that we would get the killer, or killers, and stop all this somehow. So I did the one positive thing I could do. I kept working the case, harder than ever before. 
For starters, Bree, Sampson, and I stayed at the house on 19th Street late into the night. We sucked every last drop of evidence out of the crime scene, but truthfully, there wasn't much to go on. The place was clean. It turned out that the homeowners were away for the month. None of the neighbors had seen anything unusual. No one had spotted DCAK before or after he murdered Brian Kitzmiller. I got home around 3.30 the next morning and grabbed a few hours of sleep, then pushed myself to get up and start all over again. There were patients to see first thing, but I used my early morning run to the office to go over everything in my head one more time. Then again. And again. What was I missing? He was evolving, that much was clear. Just about every successful serial killer does. It's only a matter of how. Certainly his methods were improving and growing more complex. Everything about yesterday was a little bigger. The news coverage, the daring do, and the amount of live television time he'd gotten. It was about control, wasn't it? That's what was changing most dramatically here. It crystallized for me as I sprinted across the National Mall, my lungs starting to burn. With each murder, DCAK got a little more control a little more of an edge on us, which meant, ironically, that time wasn't on our side. I was still thinking of the killer as he, but that might not be true. A man and a woman were probably working together, leaving a trail of clues for us to follow. Chapter 90 In many ways, I felt like I was leading a double life, probably because I was. After Sandy Quinlan's appointment that morning, I had Anthony DeMeo on deck, figuring I'd squeeze him in for as many sessions as possible following his meltdown. I still didn't know how things stood between the two of them since the scene that I'd witnessed in my waiting room, so I was relieved when they ignored each other on her way out that morning. Sandy looked uncomfortable. Anthony just seemed uninterested. I was glad, because this wasn't a hookup either of them needed. It just felt wrong. As soon as Sandy was gone, Anthony's demeanor began to change. He was clearly agitated and seemed shakier than usual. Despite the heat, he'd worn long trousers and a camo jacket. The latter held tightly closed as he walked inside my office and plopped on the couch. Then he stood again and began to pace around the room. Anthony was walking rapidly, hands jammed into his pockets, mumbling to himself. What's going on? I finally had to ask. You seem agitated. You think so, Doc? I had another dream, a couple nights in a row. Dream about Basra. The fucking desert. The war, the whole nine yards, bad shit, okay? Anthony, come and sit down, please. He had tried to tell me about Basra before, but hadn't said enough for me to understand where he was going with it. I gathered something terrible had happened to him in the war. I just didn't know what it was. When Anthony finally slumped down onto the couch, I spotted a lump under his jacket. I knew what it was, and I sat up straight, my blood pumping. Are you carrying? I asked. He put his hand over the bulge. It isn't loaded. Not a problem. Please give it to me, I said. You can't have a gun in here. He narrowed his eyes at me. I said it's not loaded. Don't you believe me? Anyway, I have a license to carry. Not in here you don't. I stood up now. That's it. You have to go. No, no. Here, you take it. Suddenly, Anthony reached under his jacket and pulled out a Colt 9. Take the damn gun. Slowly. Two fingers on the handle. Put it on the coffee table. Keep your other hand where it is. Anthony stared at me in a new way, as if he'd just figured something out. What are you, a cop? Just do what I asked you to do, okay? He laid the Colt on the coffee table. Once I had checked that it was empty, I locked the gun in my desk. Took a breath. Let it out slowly. Now, do you want to talk about your dream? I asked him. Basra? Uh, 